Okay, good. Thanks. Commissioner Graves. You had um, <coughs> kind of mentioned that the Planning Commission serves as a sounding board. What other roles do you see the Planning Commission serving for the City of Ottawa? So be, being new to the Planning Commission and what all they've done, my, my, my vast knowledge of it is always being going out in front of a board like similar <coughs> to what we're doing and presenting our developments of what we do. You know, I've set in just two or three more uh, recently here, and, and I'm learning a lot more. And uh, I believe it was uh, uh, Commissioner Wigan had mentioned, and, and uh, also Cal Lannis, I was speaking to him, for instance, about our airport and the importance of what that airport does to, for a community like ours. There's a lot more th that I'm going to be learning as I go, and that's why I have to be a good listener because there's a lot to the city commission that I don't understand that I want to get to understand to be a good ambassador for a community. Thank you. Great. Rudy, um, are there <coughs> questions that uh, you feel like we should have asked you today or hope that we would ask you today? No, uh, I, I was kind of prepared for these, listening to the mm -hmm. to the ones that were that had come up. But um, I'm just I'm just telling you from my heart what I see and what I want to do for the community here, and if I'm successful to be a part of this this board. Um, and then, uh, anything else you just want to add to your interview today? So, I, and I I mentioned I was talking to, to Commissioner Crowley here about um, the opportunities <coughs> that that could be in front, and, and what I'm looking for out of this as well is for you guys to help me, to teach me to be a better leader as well. I, I want to be a part of our community and, and be a good leader. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that educational process as well. Excellent. Um, are there additional questions that anybody up here has for uh, Mr. Mains? Nope. Rudy, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. Sure, thank yes. you. Commissioners, um, at the end of our um, agenda today, we will have a discussion about what you want to do about filling the vacancy for the Planning Commission. As a reminder, we do have two openings, and both of those openings um, were made by um, vacancies that unfortunately we lost two really great citizens that had sat on our city commission or our planning commission, and um, we are filling those both, um, and those both do have city residency requirements. So we are going to move on um, to items to be placed on the regular City Commission agenda, and this is always a fun one. Ms. Landis, this is always a fun one. Um, the resolution to waive statutory requirements using um, gap-based financing or gap-based gap accounting. So Melanie Landis, what do you have to tell us? Well, since this is fun and since you've seen or heard this a lot of different times, um, I'll just do a general overview of what this is for. So in preparing our financial statements, the state statute requires that municipalities use a method of generally accepted accounting principles, which we refer to as GAP. And the state statute also allows you as a governing body to adopt a resolution waiving those GAP requirements. And a waiver means that we would prepare the financial statements on a cash basis um, or in compliance with cash basis in budget laws of the state of Kansas. Um, the, the difference is that it's, a, it's less cumbersome, it's also a little less expensive overall um, for those financial statements to be audited at the end of each year, and um, just a different way of doing it. I, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Commissioners, do you have questions for <laughs> Ms. Landis regarding um, this really, and I, I was completely sarcastic when I said this was, um, something fun we actually and not that it's not fun but um, we actually address this every single year um, and so commissioners do you have questions regarding um, the statutory requirements for um, gap based finding or gap based accounting is there consensus to place it on the agenda to uh, to approve that resolution yes yes all right we shall do so thank you thank you that moves us on to um, Kansas Municipal Energy Agency um, Evergy Solar Presentation, which will be um, led, or at least initially led, by um, our Director of Utilities, Dennis Tharp, and he has brought a whole team with him today to have a conversation with us about um, solar. Yes, we have. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, we talked a little bit about this last week, and uh, we uh, wanted to get the PowerPoint that you have in front of you uh, out to you uh, last week so that you had a little chance to, to chew on that. Um, what we bring to you today is what staff believes is, is our best opportunity 
to create a, a solar generation array uh, for our community. Uh, as you all know, this is not the first time that we have brought solar in front of you. Um, there's always questions. There's always uh, always a question of, of how we move forward as a community. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that, uh, and I think we all know, renewables will become a part of every community at some point in time as we move, move forward. Um, there are a number of things uh, that we will talk about today, and uh, uh, one of those uh, has to do with renewable energy credits. We've talked about those before with, uh, with our wind farms. Um, solar creates some of those renewable energy credits also. One thing that we are beginning to see is that uh, some of our industry and some of our commercial entities uh, are be beginning to be asked at this point in time, quite honestly, I believe someplace along the line they may be forced to, to have these renewable energy credits. This is another way that we can create some of those and be able to work with our other community partners to, to possibly help them with some of that process. Um, I am not going to stand here and talk. Uh, we are going to walk, not run, through this PowerPoint presentation. At the end of this, we do not expect an answer today. It is something that we need to talk about more than once. This is a, a, a very large investment. But I believe, we believe, that it's an investment that, that we as a community need to be, begin thinking about making. So I'm going to leave it at that. I am going to bring uh, Mr. Paul Malver up to talk to you for, all, for just a little bit, and then he will introduce some of the others, both from KMEA and Evergy. Thank you. Welcome back, Paul. Yeah, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, yeah, I guess I was here less than a week ago, so it's good to see you all again. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to just briefly kind of say, you know, why we're back here again and then turn it over to the KMEA and the Evergy folks to walk you through the presentation. So I think it's been 18 to 24 months ago we were down here uh, talking about uh, solar. Um, some things have changed in those 18 to 24 months. Uh, the energy markets have changed. Um, pricing is higher, natural gas pricing is higher. So, uh, you know, a solar project looks more economical now, given the current market, con market conditions. Um, for years, since I, I've been at KMEA for six years, and I think from day one, we've been discussing solar, at least within the walls of KMEA, as well within the <coughs> membership. I think it was uh, that first year we had a solar symposium where we invited our members to come and had some vendors come in and talk about solar. So over these five to six years, I think we've talked to probably 20 to 30 different solar developers. And uh, both small scale solar, community solar, I'll call community solar, which is what we're here to talk to you about today, as well as large scale solar. And uh, <clears throat> we have, uh, over the last six to eight months, uh, we believe that it was time to try to partner up with a, a solar developer to bring those options, to bring a community solar option to our membership. And so we ended up uh, partnering up with Evergy. And you know, there's several reasons for that. Uh, Evergy is local. Uh, Evergy <coughs> has built uh, a couple solar farms, uh, one for our member in particular, Baldwin City. Uh, they're currently under contract with the city of Osage City, is another one of our members to put in solar. Um, their pricing is competitive as any that we've seen. So um, you know Evergy is going to be here. Um, a lot of these solar developers are smaller companies. Nothing wrong with that, but they're smaller companies that rely on another entity to do the financing, which is just another party to the, to the mix uh, that needs a piece of uh, that pie, if you will. So we feel very comfortable with Evergy and been working with them, like I said, for over the last eight months. Um, the other thing is, is that we're uh, bringing these opportunities to, to a number of our members, and I think Neil can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're somewhere around 15 to 20 of our members are starting to show interest in doing community solar with Evergy, which that will bring pricing down for everybody. Now everybody's going to have a different price depending on the specifics of their location and their community, 
but that buying power of having you know 10 cities 15 cities go together to buy this common equipment uh, and just the engineering some of the engineering work there's some commonality there that will bring costs down so I'll stop with that and turn it over to we've got Neil Daney who is uh, with as part of the KMEA staff and then we also have uh, Brandon Sack from Evergy that uh, will walk you through the presentation uh, I'll sit in the background and be ready to answer any questions if need be or come back at the end to, to summarize if need be so I'll turn it over to I think Brandon is gonna start Hi, good Hi, afternoon. Brandon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commission. It's nice to see you all today. Uh, the slideshow will be over here on the left, and we can go through that a little bit. But really, I, I'm here more to answer questions and just, just talk generally through the slides. So if any questions come up, please feel free to jump right in and ask. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, we have talked about this before, and really it's more of a community project that we're looking to present to the city. Um, he, he mentioned Baldwin City. So Baldwin City, we were successful in getting a university in town to do a lot of projects, to do presentations, to come visit. So we tried to get the entire community involved. We did a lot of chamber work. The chamber was able to come out and do events. Um, and, and really, the whole goal is to, to make it a project to be proud of and to own as well. So in the beginning, it starts out as something that Evergy manages, Evergy takes care of, gets it ready. And by the time we get to year seven, it's, it's, it's ready for the city to purchase and to operate. Uh, do, next do, slide, please. Do go you ahead. want us to hold our questions to last or ask them as we go through Ask this? them as we go if you'd like. Um, I guess one of the things that comes to my mind is uh, after seven years, uh, the city has the option to buy. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen if we don't exercise that option? Uh, does the energy pricing stay the same or uh, so what, it, what would be the advantage of owning after that period of time? So it'll be structured as a 30-year agreement, and the first option to purchase it would be a year seven, or yeah, year seven. And so what will be defined up front is what the energy price will be if you never purchased it. So every year there will be a price of what the energy would cost, and it's defined at the very beginning when we sign the contract. So there would be a spread between the cost of production as, and the sale price. That would be the advantage to the city. That's right. What you'll see when you look at the financials is that it'll make sense for you to buy it. It'll be a lower overall cost for the citizens, but you don't have to. Okay. It's, it's, not, it's not a commitment. And so to follow up that question, so if the city did not buy it, it would continue on just like it was for the first seven years? That's right. Evergy would continue to fully continue own and operate the okay. facility and produce All the right. city, or produce the power the for power. the city. <laughs> I think it's different from the last presentation we saw, whatever, two years ago. I think it was required the city to buy it, and okay. I didn't feel like it was right the commission to saddle that commission with the future uh, sure. debt when we may not be on that commission. But I like this <coughs> idea of the option. that gives us a lot more flexibility so, yeah. okay I got gotcha. you w would there be options uh, each year <coughs> if we didn't do it in seven maybe that ten years we would well mm -hmm. we'd ought to buy this thing huh that that's how it'd be structured you, you'd would see that option depreciate or appreciate depreciate it, yeah it depreciates it's it's cheaper it's a cheaper price to buy overall later. the later you go yes so Director Tharp mentioned that we're, there would be renewable energy credits. Are they the same as the investment tax credits? No, those are okay. different. So with the investment tax credits that Evergy would get after the seven years, if we purchase that, do, are there any investment tax credits left? And if so, does the city take those? There are not. An investment tax credit is a one-time credit. Okay, so just um, once. It is just once, yes. We get the credits for sustainable after seven, if we owned it after seven years, we would get the credits we would get that we get now off of wind energy and others. Yeah, you'll get those credits the whole time. So the, okay. the renewable credits and sustainable credits are yours from the beginning. Okay. Well, I really think we can probably go to the next slide. <laughs> I think that covered a lot of that. On that slide, what's what's SPPP? It doesn't require a what does that mean? Good back question. The, back one slide. 
So Southwest Power Pool is who manages the RTO. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, it's the Southwest Power Pool. And so it's just a level when you get into the bigger commitments, you, you have to go to the SPP level, <laughs> the Southwest Power Pool level to get the, the unit into the, just into the whole system. And it's a four or five year process right now to even get any of that started. One of the things that we also look at through the partnership is, is what are some of the things that the city could own or do to drop the price of the power purchase agreement, to also lower the price of the purchase in year seven or 10 or when you decide to pursue the option. Um, and these are some of the things that aren't eligible for the ITC that would make sense uh, through KMEA and the city. Th these are the things that, that those groups do and teams do together. Um, so these are some of the things that can help lower the price or increase the price depending on who takes over that activity. Um, and really it's just sitting down with Dennis's group and, and your team to, to understand what's best for everybody. And next slide, please. So in the numbers that are on the screen here, most of that work is right now scheduled to be done by your teams with KMEA in the city, and that helps drive these prices down here. Some of the other things that drive this price down, um, <coughs> like Mr. Malberg mentioned, was uh, a group effort by several of the KMEA cities to come together and develop multiple projects. And in that, there's an even bigger economy scales with things like the price of solar panels, um, the racking, the labor, and all of those types of things. Um, the numbers that we are gonna look at here that are on the screen right now involve exercising the option in year eight. I say after seven years, so day one of year eight is what you see on the screen. <coughs> the first seven years in the left column are simply megawatt hours, which you see in column, let's say annual MWH. MWH stands for megawatt hour. That's the amount of energy that's gonna be produced off of the facility into the city. And you simply take that times the PPA price, which in the first year was that number we just saw on the last slide. <coughs> and that's all that is. Now, what we are looking at that, that changes that number is the middle column that says value of capacity. So what that means is, in this case, we're building a five megawatt solar array. The Southwest Power Pool gives cities and utilities credit for just having steel in the ground. And that's what this is doing. We're following SPP guidelines to say that this facility, worst case, would have a 35% accreditation. And that amount of energy times what we think the capacity market might be worth is really energy or capacity is capacity. You don't have to go out and buy from the market now. So if you were to retire some units or to lose some supply that you have, this is something you don't have to go buy from the market. You get to save money because it's in your community. Um, so go ahead. Yes, sir. How do you, the megawatts hours uh, fluctuate quite a bit and they get higher towards the bottom. What, how, how, how does that work? So the annual megawatt hour column that you see, the, the very first year you have the most amount of megawatt hours, and then it decreases by about a half a percent each year. And what that is, is that's the panels degrading over time. So they can't produce the same amount of energy in year 15 that they could in year one. I see, those are, okay, I'm sorry, that those are dollars, not hours over there. Yeah, and then on the next column you see dollar per megawatt hour. So all of that is is total cost of ownership. That's that total cost of ownership column divided by megawatts, and that gives you a dollar per megawatt hour. Now what you'll see is if you were not to exercise the option, all of those, the PPA column, the white column, the first column on the left, would stay filled until time you decided to purchase it, and then it would flip over to the green column, column two. Now, what we presented here is the lowest <coughs> overall cost in a dollar per megawatt hour um, 
to the city of Ottawa. Are you using the present all the way through, or are you anticipating some inflation in cost of the megawatt hours? Good, good question. So what is in the model is that we did put inflation on O&M and material the, and insurance. Um, all of those are inflated at about 2 to 2.5% two annually throughout the entire model. What's also included here is in about year 15 or 16, the inverters which convert the DC energy to AC energy will start failing. And that is also included as a full repower in years 16 through uh, 25. Actually through year 20, actually through year 30. So just doing inverter replacements for those years is also included. And that's why you see a drastic drop when you get to year 31. Uh, your inverters are replaced, your loan is paid off. Um, now you're just enjoying the fruits of, of your investment. Yeah, I do see, <coughs> excuse me, the borrowing rate at two and a half. Now, is that, where'd that come from? Is that just a, and I can see it's an assumption, but was that based on? It just came from market feedback. Okay. Two and a half percent seemed like a good number to use, but you can use whatever number you'd like to see there. Sure. I mean, I like that number, but I just can't <laughs> say for sure it's going to be there. The other thing you don't see on here that I, that I know is mentioned is um, <clears throat> what we didn't show you was if you were to purchase this day one, which is absolutely an option, um, the cost to buy it would be just under $9 million, around $8.95 million. Okay. With us doing the investment and owning it, the year eight purchase price that we have modeled here is 6.37 million. So what you see represented in that green column is a loan for 6.3 million and paid out over 20 years at that two and a half percent, plus all of the O&M and insurance that we did anticipate. I guess that's the magic question. What will the rate be on year eight? We just don't know. It's, uh, <clears throat> and what's really easy is doing a, um, a stress test. Okay. We, can, we can easily throw 3.5%, 4.5%, 1%. See what it looks like. Yeah, we never know. <clears throat> and we can throw yeah. all of those up on the screen. So you could say by owning it, you would have, <coughs> you'd have a f fixed cost for 23 years. I mean, fixed costs as well as uh, uh, fixed rate, if you wanted to have a fixed rate. Yeah, in this case, you're controlling your power costs inside your community for all of the energy that's produced off of this. That's correct. It is absolutely in your control and not at the whim of the market, if that's what you were <coughs> asking. Would you mind running through those numbers one more time about the, um, the initial cost? What would be the initial cost if it was year one versus year eight? Year one was eight point nine four million. That would be Evergy building the array, putting it all together, with the exception of what we had the city scheduled to do, and then uh, getting it online, and then the city purchasing in it, and then running it from there. Uh, if we were to structure the PPA, then in year eight, the first time you could buy it, it was six point three seven. <coughs> And those, those will fluctuate depending on how many people jump into the program across the KMEA footprint. <coughs> um, what we've done here is, is we've, we've anticipated at least 12 megawatts of facilities coming in together in the first, in the first round. So these are based on all of those numbers. Uh, and who, who would be, would we have to arrange the financing? You've got a rate there of two and a half. Average oh. is not going to finance. Uh, so if you're talking the year seven, the year eight purchase yeah. price, came, Neil's going to come up here and he'll talk about that with you in some later slides. Yeah, I think he has some pretty good options. And and I'm going to ask our uh, city attorney if uh, this indebtedness applies towards our potential uh, cap on what we can borrow. Depending on how you finance it, whether it's utility bonds or whether it would be GEO bonds, it could count towards bond so indebtedness. So GEO, it would apply against our... Mm -hmm. And if it was utility, if it was pledged with utility revenues. There may be some flexibility, but and we'll see what options there are as in the next presenter as well for loans from them or financing options from them. 
Okay, thanks. When we heard this presentation um, in 2020, um, the year eight purchase price was $4.1 million. I mean, that's a considerable amount of difference between. You, it depends on the size. I don't remember what size we were looking at. Uh, five was megawatt. It, it was a five megawatt then too? Yeah, I just pulled the exact slide. So what I will say is that two years ago, everything was cheaper. And what we're looking at here is 2022 pricing for, for solar. Um, what I've seen just in the past six months, I imagine most of you who are business owners have seen in the past six months. So you're simply seeing inflation here. Well, and Mayor, if I may, that's what, uh, to address that a little bit too, when we presented this before, it was more front-loaded than what it is right now. That is one of the reasons that we came back with this. If you look at the total price, year one is very close okay. it changes the year seven price because we were more front loaded at that point in time we were paying more up front than what we are now okay good thank you help? yes you want to talk about flat versus yeah, yeah. so i what, what he's referring to is that this structure the first year price was $39.75 a megawatt hour, but it, but it grows at 2.5% annually. So each year that price is 2.5% higher. What we presented before was a flat 30-year rate. So all 30 years were the exact same price on a PPA, a dollar per megawatt hour rate. And so that would lower the year, the day one year rate purchase price because you would be paying more in the first seven years. The next slide, please. And this is my last slide. Planning these is, is it takes a little while uh, when we have to, we have work to do with the county, we have work to do with the city, and we have work to do with landowners, uh, engineers, prep. Um, so we, we would look to start <coughs> planning um, as soon as possible, as soon as we could. Um, but this is looking for an online date of uh, 2024 or 2025. Some of the reasons for the 24 and 25, as of now, the investment tax credit, we have panel safe harbor to take advantage of the 30% investment tax credit, which means we have panel sitting in a warehouse as Evergy that we can use towards this project, <coughs> but we have to have it online by 2025 in order to take advantage of that. If it, right now, if it moves to 26, that changes the pricing and that tax credit. And I think you had indicated that in your last um, presentation to us, too, that there is a decrease in. Yeah, it, it, it's 30% is what we have safe harbored. If it moves to 26 with the way everything is right now, it would drop to 10% ITC. Yes, sir. What's the, what's the tracking thing? Did I miss something there? Oh. Well, this is, this is saying that we would be looking at a tracking facility for uh, this array, which means that the, the panels would move with the sun throughout the day. Oh, really? They would tilt and follow the sun across the mm. sky. I think initially we proposed a fixed system. This would be something that, as technology has grown and become more efficient, it, it, on a levelized cost, it makes more sense to use a tracking system today. Okay. And just another yes, question, uh, just a general question. I'm thinking, I, I, I'm thinking in eastern Kansas we have more cloudy days than say Scott County, Kansas. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wouldn't this be better out there? Mm -hmm. And except that maybe the cost of transmission back to here uh, costs the difference between fewer sunny days here. But <coughs> how does that relate? What? That's that's right. That's that, that, okay. that's it. I just I mean, was guessing how that why yeah. it is because I would think when we have cloudy days, I know it still can produce energy, but it's not as efficient as it would full yeah. sun. Right? And some, some other things you'll see too is you, you may have the perfect day here where you don't have needs for energy and it, it may be just really sunny out there. So it's really producing on a day you don't necessarily meet it, need it, 
right. um, or it's or it's uh, you know even the perfect cloudy day. You know, if it was here, you wouldn't really need the solar production, and it would be off as well with the load. Out there, it may be going full tilt. Yeah. The other thing too, it may be 105 degrees here, and the storm may be rolling through western Kansas. You're not getting any solar production, and it could be helping you right here locally on your lines, That's producing it. for your citizens right. at this cost. Okay. And uh, what about being near an airport? Does that create any concerns that it should be so far from an airport? <coughs> yeah, so we, we perform an FAA study, and I believe we did on this site already, and I okay. think it has passed. And it did pass, yeah. even though it's within a couple miles of the airport, yep. I guess, because yes. the flight patterns were okay. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> One of the things that concerns me about about this, and it, it, it at any time, uh, it will be a concern because I got a feeling the efficiency of solar panels have improved over the last 20 years since we've been talking about solar energy. Every mm -hmm. signs are <coughs> lit up now with solar and all that stuff. And so their efficiency has been improved vastly. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think it's going to improve exponentially over the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. How do we, do we, has anybody done a study of like if, you know, they produce twice as much energy yeah. with the new panels 10 years from now or seven years from now and we want to take it over. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> well, so, I mean, is that something you're just going to bet on? You're going to be stuck with an older panel less efficient than what you could have new? I mean, that's just the way it, it is? It, yeah, and I think we've seen that all through time. We, we put these these gas turbines in in 1950 and in 1960 they came out with more yeah. efficient gas turbines sure. same, same thing with solar I, the way the way i look at it is we're locking in we're diversifying our portfolio and we're starting by locking in a piece of it right now and we really like these prices and it makes a lot of sense but we're not oversubscribing to the point where when the new technology comes out in eight nine or ten years that we can't jump on that one too so I, I think even talking with Dennis, he's really thinking about that as well towards the future and trying to piece together a puzzle that, that can make a lot more sense for everybody. And Commissioner, should these panels ever begin to fail, they can be replaced. That doesn't mean we have to go in and do a whole new array. We can buy panels to replace the panels that are in at, the, at this point in time, should they ever begin to fail, or we see such efficiency that it makes it uh, an economic benefit to do so. Thank you, Commissioner. What other questions do you have for Brandon? Thank you for being here again today. Appreciate your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Are we talking about buying? Buying the land or renting the land to put these go on. Okay. So while Neil and Brandon talk, <coughs> we're going to have Dennis. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> we have actually uh, negotiated uh, a, a lease option with a landowner uh, out around Proximity Park. Uh, I spoke with uh, this landowner recently, and they are still interested in the prospect of us of us leasing the property. Um, the, the, the suggested lease cost is $500 an acre, which would be $20,000 a year for that, for that 40 acres mm -hmm. that, uh, that it would take to, to do this array. Uh, we have talked about an escalator in there as we move forward. That's a detail that has not been worked out, so I'm not even gonna delve into that right at this point in time. Uh, but uh, we do have an av available 40 acre track that, that we can can do this with one of the reasons that we look that direction honestly is that uh, it is right next to our proximity park and uh, we believe that uh, that this would be an attraction for for many that come and look at proximity park and are interested in renewables which nearly everybody is these days now, Dennis, what was that price again per acre? You said? It was 500 per acre on 40 acres. Per year. <coughs> or per, per, year. per year. Per year, yes. Well, that sounds pricey. Is that just my... For, for renting that, pasture That now. quite honestly is less than what some folks from other areas have come in and lease property in our area for. Uh, I can tell you that at least on 
uh, a number of different properties that I know about, um, that's about half of what they're paying to just hold property. My goodness. Mm. Okay, because even to rent our farm ground at the airport is... Reach, uh, reach corn. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, there's <coughs> several acres leased around Franklin County right now that are leased for the specific purpose of solar at some point. Yeah. And quite honestly, these landowners were told they have no idea, you know, when they might or might not move forward with, with these projects, they just want to lock up the property. Yeah. Okay. And so they're paying uh, large dollars to do so. Uh, of course, I remember paying 500 an acre for crop ground to buy it. <laughs> so I'm not eight. That, that doesn't eight happen. Yeah. <laughs> that dates yeah. me, I guess. I can okay. remember that myself. So wow. let's not talk about that too long, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> The other one that I would point out that was talked about a little bit in the in the uh, the PowerPoint was the the things that the city would uh, take upon themselves, and uh, you saw in there uh, things like grading and fencing and uh, interconnection, you know, to our system. Remember, this is behind the meter. We will co connect directly to um, the power lines that we have out there at Proximity Park and then push it onto our system, our system, not onto the bulk system. Uh, those are all things that we are very capable of. Those are what we sometimes lovingly refer to as soft costs. You know, the things that, that our folks can accomplish, uh, setting the transformer, doing some of those kinds of things are all things that we are internally capable of doing. And so that's why we've talked about those things. And that's not to say we all know the price of fencing uh, it hinges on the cost of the fence itself, much less the labor to put it in, you know, and all the things that we're talking about have a certain amount of material involved with them, except for possibly the grading and, and some of those kinds of things. But those are all things that we can accomplish internally. With that, Neil. Neil, welcome to the Auto City Commission. We're glad for you to join us today. Great. Thank you for having me, Mayor Commissioners. Um, yeah, Paul had mentioned um, the interest that we're getting from our other municipalities in Kansas, and and he is he is correct. We have about 15, 20 cities that have expressed in interest in community solar. So we think uh, with this first tranche, as Brandon mentioned, we'll probably have 10 to 15 megawatts of interest, which will drive down the the price um, that that Brandon uh, presented earlier. Um, Want to address the issue of uh, a financing. We do have a history of issuing debt um, on other um, projects for other municipalities. So if that would be a, of interest to um, the city of Ottawa and other uh, member cities of, of KMEA, um, the idea would be to, to pool um, that investment at that time and go out and issue debt for um, four or five municipalities for, say, $10 million or $15 million or whatever the, the number was. So. Just wanted to, whatever worked out for the city of Ottawa, or when you want to keep it on the balance sheet or have us do it, we have a, um, some history of, of doing that for other municipalities. Um, I wonder, could you get to the next slide, please, sir? Uh, the next one after that one, sorry. Um, okay. And maybe we can come back to the, that one. Um, you know, we've worked with um, Dennis and Dave and, and Rocky over the last. I've been with KMEA for 13 years, and over the last 10 years, definitely they've been an integral part of, of putting together a portfolio. And you guys have a really diverse portfolio here at, at Ottawa um, with the amount of projects that you're in and the, the type of resources that you have. One of the, the larger pieces of that pie is GRDA, which is Grand River Dam Authority out of Oklahoma. That's a large um, resource to the city of Ottawa and other municipalities that we have in our portfolio. That one is going to expire, is set to expire uh, April of 2026. So when that um, expires, and we, we've talked to GRDA about a possible extension or, or a, uh, a hybrid extension, what that might look like. Um, if, if that doesn't come through or if we elect to do something else, this particular community solar project just gives you another layer, another layer of diversity. I know that was talked about by, by Paul and by, by Brandon, but we want to layer in just different resources, different diversity, um, different timelines. So when you do get to these different milestones that we're not left with going out and securing a lot of, uh, of mega, megawatt hours at one time. 
So um, in conjunction to, to GRDA, you guys are a part owner of Dogwood, which is a combined cycle plant in Pleasant Hill. And that's going to be good as long as they continue the maintenance on that. That might be good for 25, 30, 40 years, depending on the, the maintenance of that. So that's a good long-term resource. And then Buckeye Wind uh, goes through 2033. Marshall Wind goes through 2036. And then you have uh, a couple federal hydro projects, WAPA, uh, Western, Hour, uh, Western Area Power Administration, and then uh, SPA, which is Southwestern Power Administration. So those run from uh, 2054 or 2034. So you can see that um, the later projects, you guys have a lot of time left, but the lion's share of your, your energy is coming from uh, GRDA, and that's set to expire here in the next five years. So we're looking for different layers, different pieces to, to fit in. Um, any questions on that? I, this one here. Sure. Yeah, no. Well, Ooh. I just see on the GRDA we got 12 megawatts and nine, which is it one or the other or both or different that's, times? That's a great question. So the way the contract works is you're required to take uh, <coughs> 12 megawatts um, in the summer, so okay, June, well, July, August, and SEP. And then um, the other months you have the option to take nine or, or 12. Okay. Um, most of the time um, it hasn't really been it, – it's been – convincingly take nine because it makes sense um, to do that in all the months where it's not the summer we have to do it but this winter we actually are, are um, with the events that happened last February which I'm sure you guys are all aware of what happened we're actually ramping up um, the GRDA for for this winter up to up to 12 um, for January and February would you would remind me again of GRDA where's that produced and what is what kind of energy is it What's it produced from? Sure. Uh, so that's Grand River Dam Authority out of Oklahoma. And it is, a, they have a nice uh, portfolio down there. So you got, you, you would think with uh, the name Grand River Dam Authority that it had like 80 or 90 percent hydro. Well, that's that's not the case. Um, they've got a, a nice uh, uh, array of um, combined cycle, coal, uh, they have hydro, uh, they have wind. So they have a, a really nice portfolio. So you're getting a system product is really what you're getting out of that. Thanks. Yes, sir. And so four years from now, we have no idea what kind of pricing or GRDA, how they would, what we could work out with them, I guess. And so there's some risk involved with that coming soon, whereas the, this plan here would be to replace a portion of that, I suppose. That's what the, the five megawatts, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner, I'm sorry. You know, they're, today they're willing to extend the contract to the current pricing. We're hoping to do that. I like that. And so Dogwood um, taps out, wait, I'm not sure what LLP is. Oh, uh, a life of plant. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry. A lot of uh, jargon. Um, going on to the next, the next slide. So this is uh, fast forward to 2024, 2025, um, and that's kind of the the, the commercial operating date timeline for this community solar project, just where the supply chain issues are and then the investment tax credits uh, is where we see this portfolio kind of coming in is 2024, 2024 2025. Um, you can see that uh, you're, you're a little oversubscribed with your energy, but um, you know it's really just for one year and it's really um, not a big deal um, in today's marketplace because you're getting full compensation for that excess energy. So um, to have uh, one year, 18 months, where you may have a little more um, power that you're selling into the market than what you actually need really isn't a financial hindrance on the uh, auto at all. Doesn't it also mean that we're not um, a it appears as in the last um, slide that we have 6% of our energy is actually left to the market um, energy, and so we buy at whatever's the market rate. And so at 2024, 2025, when we would, if we were to put in this particular um, solar option, we would not be um, relying on market energy at that point. Or open market energy. That that is correct. That is correct. You would you would limit your portfolio, which, you know, the last uh, five to seven years, uh, you would want to have more market energy, um, just because the market is really heavily reliant upon natural gas. 
natural gas is starting to spike um, recently, kind of fluctuates up and down. <coughs> uh, but you know, one of the things from a from a community standpoint is w is this project? What's this project going to do to my overall wholesale power cost? That would be uh, probably something that you all are are certainly sensitive to. If we were to go out and purchase just an energy replacement to uh, mirror what this particular project would produce for the city, and this would just be energy only without the capacity, uh, which is a, just an extra added benefit that you would get from the solar project, you're, you're probably looking at the low $40 per megawatt hour fixed mm -hmm. over 10 years. So that would be the alternative for a peaking product if you were to just buy a, a peaking product from Evergy or from another marketer or another utility um, that, that we deal with. So you, you're really not um, overextending yourself on paying a, a lot more for, for this project. And um, you know the capacity, as we mentioned, is something that when GRDA expires, you have a couple different options. You can um, either bu uh, build something here, um, add units to your fleet, or we can go on the open market and purchase it, or you can put a, a solar project in, and that will count towards your SBP capacity requirements. So, there's a multitude of things we can do, but um, just you know, representing seven percent of your of your energy um, in the high thirty, low forty dollar per megawatt hour range really isn't gonna. You won't see really a change at all in your wholesale pricing from from KMEA. So is that about where we are now? <clears throat> yes, sir. And that so all in for your capacity, energy, everything that that KMEA does, all the projects that you're involved in. You're right around four and a half to five cents per kilowatt hour on an annual basis. That's what the city of Ottawa is paying. I see on this pie chart we've got a negative one percent. Is that right? Yes, sir. So That's that would be just with all of the resources you currently have, and then with the introduction of the community solar project, you probably have um, 12 to 18 months where you may have a little more resources <coughs> than, than what the load requirements are. But again, you're going to get full market compensation for overproducing, if you will. Um, okay. So it's really not a financial hindrance to the, to the community. Okay. Of course, I've never seen negative interest rates before in either, mm -hmm. but this is something I get this, so mm -hmm. all right. Mm -hmm. What questions do you have, Commissioners, for Neil? Have you financed any projects recently when you talk about c combining resources, combining municipalities? You have a greater chance of getting a better deal when we go to borrow money. Have you dealt with any n no rates currently with anything that you're dealing with today? I'm going to turn that over to Paul. He's okay. probably got a better <laughs> pulse on that. I'm just kind of curious on that. <coughs> So we, we actually just refunded uh, a bond uh, for Garden City. Okay. Um, we closed last week. I wish I could tell you what the all-in interest rate is, but I can't because I don't know it oh, yet. Okay. All right. But I will tell you that we, we saved them $6.9 million present value over oh, the, you know, the extension uh, or the refunding of that project. And we actually did that taxable because uh, we couldn't do an advanced tax-exempt refunding. So okay. we're always looking to do that, so yeah. And then the one that uh, Ottawa's familiar with is the dogwood plant that Neil mm -hmm. mentioned. There was five cities in, in that project. KMEA went out and did the, the financing for that with the five oh. for the five cities. Okay. So, you know, that's just an option for you. Right. Um, you know, the city can obviously go out and do their own tax-exempt financing, but um, there could be some benefits if... It all lines up that we have five or six communities that want to buy their solar project in year seven. We could go out and do that as a group and uh, obviously save costs that way. Okay. <clears throat> and there's another general question I had when we were talking about this, but this new tracking system, I'm assuming that also increases the efficiency of the units? Y yeah, you'll, you'll get more energy out of that, and you'll get to extend the, the time that it's producing during the middle of the day. Okay. So if you, and they have charts, I know, the a non-tracking system, it's pretty peaky. Yeah. <laughs> Where right. the tracking system, it, it's more bell-shaped. Okay. Yeah. 
And then and there's one other thing I wanted to mention. We, we uh, uh, there's some uh, some synergies here. If if we get a number of communities to move forward with Evergy or do community solar, we recently purchased an engineering construction company that have engineers and and construction folks, so we can help on the front end uh, to help the city uh, with their engineering that they need to connect to their system. Uh, but probably more importantly, if it works out, we could we could do the O and M. Uh, the contract has Evergy doing the O and M those first number of years, but Evergy is willing to contract with us to do the O and M, which we think we could probably do it cheaper. cheaper too. Um, you know, it doesn't take uh, it takes less than a one FTE full time equivalent to maintain one of these. Okay. So if we've got a number of them around, we can share in that FTE, if you will, and the expertise of doing the inverter replacements and so forth. So there, there's some synergies here. Um, uh, if we, if if it happens to work out that a number of communities move forward. Okay. Is there, so is there, <coughs> sorry, I just want to follow up on what you were just saying. So if KMEA were um, to go ahead and move forward on doing the O and M in lieu of Evergy, what kind of cost saving is that to the project? I don't know if we've worked through those numbers, but mm -hmm. that is something as we move down this road. Uh, it's certainly not the, a cost elevation. It's going to be a cost savings. It should be. A, it should obviously be a cost savings. We we believe anyway. So again, if it's not, then let Evergy do it. Right. But, right. But that's data that you certainly, when we go to actually deal with this um, and make decisions moving forward, I recognize it's an information gathering point. Right. Um, but that's certainly data that you would have available. Yes, absolutely. One more question about the efficiency of the panels. I guess today we're here. We are the shortest day of the year talking about this, but I assume that as the summer progresses, more daylight hours they become more efficient as well. Oh, when absolutely. Needed. We should get these experts up here, and they can tell you okay. exactly right. how it is. But yeah, you're going to produce more <coughs> during the summer when you need it. Longer, more. longer yeah. daylight hours. That makes sense. Um, so, and that's when you want it, right? Yeah, right. And, yeah. and, and you know, the mix that you have, wind. Unfortunately, if you look at a wind production curve it likes to produce during the night you oh. know wind produces more at night than during the day so solar you kind of combine solar and wind together and you get kind of a nice product I got you. so it, it does fit with kind of the portfolio you have today it seemed like last wednesday or thursday it was producing <laughs> just pretty much uh, uh, oh yeah around charts. well yeah. Yeah. yeah actually they might not have been producing at all because they, <laughs> exactly. they hit a certain wind speed they shut down so <laughs> well, darn it. it might have been a little bit too windy that day yeah just a little bit Smidge. Is there a, uh, <clears throat> and I don't know how long you've been talking about uh, uh, the programs uh, that we're talking about now, or, but is there one that has been in operation several years that we could go visit and talk to the manager? On right up the road in Baldwin yeah. City. I mean, they've been in business. Ever G, I think that was about two years ago. Yeah, two years ago they had that up and running. It's been running for about two years. Okay. And it's a one megawatt solar project. Um, and Baldwin's actually looking to do another project. So, and, and, and is that the oldest one around? Oh no, you could you can go across the the border into Missouri. There's quite a few, not too far. Butler, Missouri, has a three megawatt project that's been whew, operation quite a while, five six years. I know you drive um, drive across the country and you see more and more all the time, and some really big acreages of them. Yeah, yeah, and and. W w I also want to point out that KMEA is still looking at large-scale solar. Uh, we cannot drive one of those large-scale projects, but what we're hoping, just like we couldn't drive a wind project, we're hoping to do bring an opportunity at some point that's like those the Buckeye and the Marshall wind where we grab a slice of a bigger project. So we're continuing, we're in continuous talks with these large-scale solar developers too. There's one not too far up the road that we're talking with um, as well. So uh, that would be another opportunity to kind of diversify your, your pie chart and fill in that, that big blue half, you know, that half pie there. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, <clears throat> the efficiency, you know, how important the efficiency is and all that, and the uh, capturing, you know, what we can from the solar, as much as we can from the solar by the tracking and all that. But I, I, I don't think we've talked much about the storage. And I think that if we're going to, you know, if we're going to try to, if we're going to try to capture all that we can, we certainly want to use all that we do capture. Um, so I think that's something we want to look at too, is what, 
what we need for storage if we if it was necessary and what the cost of that would be also yeah and we can do that uh, just generally speaking storage today isn't economical to do uh, unless you have other drivers to do that um, so this project can be designed to bring in storage at some point uh, when that does make sense okay uh, or that next project that you may do may be a solar slash storage project together. Um, but sitting here today, we wouldn't recommend to you to do storage unless there were some other drivers there. Uh, storage can be used to help out on lines that are having issues. And city of Minneapolis actually just put in a, a, um, a battery storage project. And it was mainly due to that they were limited in how much they can import into their system. So the storage is going to help them with that. So. Okay. Other questions that you have for um, CAMEA, for Evergy, regarding their presentation today? I think there was a timeline on that PowerPoint. Is that something yeah, that you guys? Yeah, you can go back, go back a couple of slides. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, which is yeah. Just basically saying what goes forward. But I think at some point uh, the next step would be that the city would show some hey we, we, either we want to move forward or not if you want to move forward there would probably be some type of a memorandum of understanding that would then start kicking off the details of getting into the engineering and your site design and narrowing down uh, what that PPA that purchase power agreement would look like mm -hmm. so I guess I'm I'd uh, like to ask a uh, practical question uh, will Evergy be paying uh, property tax on the uh, installation until we buy it? I think that depends. <laughs> so. that's, that's a good question. So in the state of Kansas, renewable energy is tax, ex tax exempt for the first 10 years. And then after that, it's really what you're going to work out with Franklin County, because I'm not sure they know how to tax it okay. in year 11 either. Thank you. Any other questions that you may have regarding uh, the presentation for from KMEA or Evergy? All right, I don't believe so. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, commissioners, I'm going to ask you just for a two-minute break, if I could have one, um, and we will start back up in just two minutes, early at 5.02. <laughs> Yes, 
sharing text. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, great. Glad you got that. <laughs> I wondered if you were going to read it. I was like, okay. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see. Hey, sir. Are we ready to get back started again? Sorry, it's 5.04, so yeah. I doubled our break time. Sorry. Um, that moves us on to um, Ottawa Main Street Association funding agreement, and I believe that our city attorney will be addressing that today since our city manager is not present. Well, Madam Mayor, we uh, you should have in your packet the uh, revised uh, Ottawa Main Street funding agreement. We do have some representatives from Main Street here in the audience, so if you would like to hear from them, uh, the change concerns the, uh, I think, the financing statements or financial statements uh, and the use of city funds. But uh, Cal Lannis is here on behalf of Main Street. I think he's got some guests with him and might have them uh, clarify a little bit since I know he and Richard worked on that language. Mr. Lantis, would you like to um, come and, and visit with us? I know that we had some questions last time, but we certainly are glad to have you back here and glad that you brought um, guests with you. So Thank tell you. us what's going on at Ottawa Main Street. <laughs> Uh, Madam Mayor and Commissioners, uh, before I start, I want to apologize. I heard some of the best words I thought I would never hear in my life on Friday afternoon, and that is, you have bronchitis. In other words, my COVID test came back <laughs> negative and my flu test came back negative, but I'm still going to wear the mask today to address you. So, uh, uh, yes, first of all, I would like to introduce you to Board Member Brenda Hayden, who's over here, and our uh, director candidate, almost director-elect, but we haven't signed a formal contract, Megan Young. Megan is from Baldwin. Uh, she's had her own uh, social media company for several years. Uh, she has a uh, uh, bachelor's in English and creative writing from the University of Kansas and something that will suit her very well for uh, working with the Main Street Association. She has a minor in psychology. So, you know, as we try to balance all these balloons in the air, why, I think that'll be a great help to her. So uh, we're, we're happy to have, uh, to have come to an agreement with her pending our, our funding. So. Uh, uh, and she would start on January the 2nd, January the 3rd, I guess, the 2nd is a Monday. Is there night. anything that you would like to address regarding um, the change in, I know that we have a red line copy on the funding agreement? Uh, basically, I think the two things that we changed, one was uh, uh, we changed our address. They had the wrong address on there, the chamber address on there. The other thing was uh, dealt with the uh, mechanism for accounting. We had, uh, we had had on our old agreement that we would have two separate funds. And the account that we're working with to try to streamline our, uh, I'm sorry, two separate checking accounts, not separate funds. The, and the accounting firm that we're working with has suggested that we have one checking account, but we separate the funds by codes. And I'm sure uh, Ms. Landis could, could, could address that a lot better than I could, but there's a, there's a way to, to do have, have one account and have funds for different sources of income and different sorts of expenses. And that's what we want to do. So it, in fact, it would make it easier for you it would make it easier for us it would make it easier for the state to understand because a lot of times you have to write two separate checks to the same entity for a split in what we do and so we just want to try to we want to try to avoid that and then there i think i didn't realize there was a uh, a change in the usage i may not have seen that but i think it was just to uh give us a little more flexibility by coming back to you when we need to make an adjustment in case we have to run into something like we'd had in the pandemic where funds that are supposed to be used from promotion and and that sort of thing from you could actually be used to offset some of our fixed expenses in times of need. Commissioners, do you have questions uh, for Mr. Lantis um, regarding uh, the proposal that is in front of you? I don't have any co uh, questions, just some comments. <coughs> I was, uh, I did make the meeting a um, week or so ago when, when, uh, when you guys first uh, interviewed uh, Megan, and then I was part of the interview uh, the other day. Um, 
I, I, I think Megan will be a good fit, uh, young and energetic. Um, I think that degree will also help with dealing with us too, quite honestly. Um, <coughs> I, yeah, I, I, I think they're, they're headed in the right direction, quite honestly. So I have no problems with uh, continuing on with the funding as is. Hmm. I would agree with Commissioner Crowley on that. And I got thinking too, what would Ottawa look like if we did not have a Main Street? Could you elaborate a little bit on that, Cal? Well, I mean, probably the biggest change you'd notice until somebody <clears throat> took it over, reorganized, would be a change in the uh, would be a change in the corners uh, because we have been organizing that now for I think five or six years. Uh, Funding is going to be a little different this year, so there'll be a little bit of a change. But you know, we're pretty noted for our downtown corners. Uh, uh, the summer fest would go away until somebody we find somebody to take it over. The spook parade, which is probably one of our biggest events, would go away. Uh, and the Christmas parade, you'd have to find somebody new to organize that. I mean, those would be the major, almost immediate things you would see. And then the other things would be uh, where we're working with uh, uh, FCDC to do a downtown building inventory and a rent and ownership uh, uh, study right now. Uh, our promotions are always working. I think we mentioned the um, uh, Art in the Park thing that we're trying to bring back to Ottawa. So it's a, it, it, there's, there's some significant physical things that you would notice almost immediately. There's some more, and I don't know if esoteric is the right word, but there's some more uh, things that aren't quite as measurable that we do on a regular basis, I think, that, that the community would okay. miss as well. Well, I just asked that question in the context of It's a Wonderful Life, my favorite movie, mm -hmm. and so I kind of want to see what you'd say. Well, I didn't say. I, I have <laughs> looked, and we <laughs> haven't seen Jimmy Stewart, but the, but the, that part's still open if we'd like okay. to find some. <laughs> okay, <that>. <laughs> thanks. Well, I, I, I think one of the other <laughs> things, maybe it's intangible but it, it's uh, it unifies the merchants I think in downtown if they uh, belong to a Main Street organization they all have something in common and uh, can share ideas and and uh, uh, get some help and guidance from time to time I think that there's a certain amount of value there we have resources with the IWW loans the incentives without walls loans we have uh, the facade grants that we give people just to help them just spiff up the front of their buildings. Uh, and then we have, you know, as long as we keep a Main Street uh, membership with the State Association and the National Historic Society with their Main Street program, then we have some other resources that are available to downtown buildings that would go away should we not be a member of the state and national associations. Any other questions uh, for um, Cal or for our city attorney regarding the funding agreement that is before us? Um, I know that we had put this on our regular agenda um, last week. Uh, is this something, I don't, is it a rush to pass? I don't think there's a rush, is there? Do you have any no, we don't have any urgent. I think the I think Richards uh, mentioned was just the fact that uh, he'd like to have it voted on prior to the end of the year. He'd like to have it in place prior to the end of the year. And I don't know what your schedule is. I don't know if you have a regular meeting between now and then or not. But he would like to have it put on. And there was some discussion on. I believe I believe to quote the city attorney, a meeting is a meeting is a meeting. So, <laughs> smart guy. <laughs> I, I don't see any reason to extend it any longer. We, I think we're ready to vote on it. Well, then we have to have I, a motion. I, if I was uh, <laughs> Megan, I would want to know whether we're going to get any funding. Would you like to make a motion, yeah. Commissioner? I would like to make that oh, motion. That's what that I we do uh, approve the uh, funding agreement with the Main Street Association. I'd second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the funding agreement as listed in our agenda. Um, is there any discussion among commissioners? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same <coughs> sign. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, that moves us to um, the Markley edition preliminary plat, which <coughs> is um, page 19 on our agenda. <coughs> Mrs. Lee. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as you probably recall, preliminary plats are, are just shown to you for just to make you aware that uh, projects are happening and so that in advance of a final plat that will ultimately come to you for uh, acceptance of all easements, rights of ways, and uh, et cetera, uh, and, and the improvements that are made, the public improvements, which in this case um, really relate to water and sewer. Um, 
that you see the preliminary plat. So this is a, a tract um, that's being, uh, it's really kind of a replat, but re is divided um, and um, it's been vacant forever. So um, the Planning <coughs> Commission held a, plan, uh, a public hearing. There was some neighbors in attendance, but there were no comments. Um, the applicant uh, proposes four single family lots and five townhome lots. Um, each of those would be divided once they're constructed uh, and a survey is conducted. Uh, there are two exceptions um, in order for this plot to move forward. The Planning Commission agreed to. One was for the lot depth in Block 1. Uh, the minimum in our subdivision regulations is 120 feet. It's 118, so it's so minor it's not worth much, yeah. but we need to call it out. Um, and the other is that um, <coughs> the lots in Block 2 are actually uh, just shy of full lot size. Um, they do fall within the 10% administrative variance that, that the ICANN grant, um, but because it's a plat, we really, it's, it's not so much a variance, it's really kind of an exception that we wanted to call out. Um, and that then results in lots that are um, 4,050. Um, and, and so the Planning Commission was comfortable with that um, and, and have allowed the applicant to proceed. Um, so we just wanted to let you know about that. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. I see there's a street on the east side. Is it Mason, is there a street there now? Yeah, Mason is um, a very <coughs> low traveled street, mostly ag related <coughs> to the adjacent owners. I know our public works director can answer that, but we, the plan, um, uh, public works and utilities worked, there, there's, we put sewer down that, if you recall, oh, okay. when we did the east side interceptor. Um, they changed a manhole to make it a little more navigable um, for regular vehicles. Um, and then the plan is once the construction is complete that the um, road would be chip sealed. Is that correct, Director Hapley? Yep. Yeah, right now we plan to chip seal that after construction. Um, we got into an issue with another project that we had chip sealed a gravel street and with all the heavy traffic on it, we ended up redoing the street afterwards. So. We would hold off on on doing that street until after the project's done. Okay, this isn't in the floodplain or anything, is it? No, is sir. We're good there. Okay, yes. good. Thanks, Mrs. Lee. Is this all single-family homes pr no. proposed? Well, single-family attached on those townhomes, but yes. So on um, west side, the attached probably. No, east side. That that was a mistake I made actually. The the west side are <coughs> the single-family lots. They're larger. Yeah. The attached lots are those smaller tracks to the east. Um, which probably fits in a little bit better with what's across to the west. Um, but if you really look at that area, when you look at my memo, you're going to see we have a large uh, variance in lot sizes over there because um, we have some manufactured housing that was um, is there. And so a lot of those lots were smaller to begin with. Is there infrastructure on this lot? The infrastructure will be created um, with the applicant. There is some, um, just like the road is in, um, but they do have to extend some utilities. And at whose cost will that be? That's at the developer's cost. And then um, on the chip and seal for the street, the street improvement, at whose cost will that be? That will be at the city's cost. Is there an estimated cost for the street improvement? I don't have that right there. The city manager <coughs> agreed to, the, actually the applicant didn't ask. We had conversation about whether we were going to require the developer to do it. Um, and because it was an open street and we have been making efforts to chip sale all of our gravel streets, the city manager determined that's how we would approach this one because it was going to create additional housing lots, which has, uh, is, is an effort to, re to respond to our housing needs. Is this in the NRP? It is in the Neighborhood Revitalization Program. The applicant could have asked for an RHID, but, which is a longer period of time, but preferred to go ahead and do all the cash uh, expense themselves for the infrastructure that they're required to do and then use neighborhood revitalization. So j just as a clarification then, so um, this applicant is in, or the, the developer is in an NRP and we're paying for streets. We're paying addition. for the street and they're paying for be the utilities. No okay. So we're, the street already exists. Yes. That's already our obligation. Yeah. And that's how the city manager approached it is that the street is already there the, the applicant's gonna create a little bit more traffic, but the the street is ours already. 
it's not a new street. <clears throat> yeah, we'll certainly address some of our housing issues too. I like to see that. Yes, and similar to the project that Mike referenced up on the north side, that subdivision also abutted a street that was open but not in good shape, and yeah. we had improvements to be made. Okay, um, commissioners, do you have questions about this presentation? Is there movement that you need on this, Mrs. Lee? Nope, it's just information. Okay. Uh, questions, commissioners? No, I, um, I don't really have any questions, but uh, we need the housing, and um, keep, it, keep it going as far as I'm concerned. All right. Um, that moves us on to our capital improvement plan, Mrs. Lee. Um, yes. Earlier this year, when we brought forward the 21 to 25 capital improvement plan, uh, it was as we were already working on our budget. <coughs> and um, at the time, Commissioner Jorgensen said, how can we not see this earlier? Well, we had been doing it the same for many years. Staff has been off and on for 10 years talking about how to, how to start the process in the fall so that it's well complete before we even get close to starting the budget process. Um, so with the commission's urging, that's what we did. Um, we sought public participation at the early, at the beginning of uh, the discussion, um, and we did get a couple of suggestions, and then staff worked up both what was approved in the 2022 budget, which helps inform the 22 column, um, as well as then that being able to inform us for our 2023 budget, and if the budget for example, if something wants to move from 24 to 23, then that, that will, again, reinform this for next year. Um, so um, staff, uh, well, uh, Melanie Landis and I met with all the directors and went through all the projects with them and the timing, a number of things <coughs> were adjusted. Some things were pushed out beyond the five-year plan that they're still in the CIP, they're just not in what you're seeing here. So if somebody were to compare to the one approved earlier this year, it's just because other projects took priority at this time. Um, the CIPs, part of what the CIP should be doing is not only informing our budget, but obviously looking at our long-term financing. Uh, currently, with both um, ARPA and infrastructure money pending out there, um, just me, I'm going out the door, but I, I suspect that the CIP will be um, a bit fluid here this next couple of years as we try to take advantage of any other funding, which is <coughs> the point, really, of a yeah. CIP. And again, some we have projects in there for 10 and 15 years um, that you don't see, but the idea is if funding comes along um, or, or a need arises earlier than expected, that we do treat it just as a plan. It's not, it's not, it's not a promise that this is the year, but that this is goals that we would like to have, and these are opportunities in these years to maybe do them without overwhelming our financial picture. Um, so, Planning Commission held a hearing. There were no additional comments other than the Planning Commissioners made some comments about a few of the projects that they were glad to see there. There was a discussion about the airport, um, a comment that uh, ADA work at the, at the OMAVE they were glad to see. And I will tell you, the Accessibility Advisory Board met after this was called out and that was a conversation they had that the building with the most capacity to hold individuals that we own is still not accessible uh, and <coughs> so some urging there I think to continue to keep that project alive in one some manner or another uh, a lot of conversation just around the aquatic center and that some of the um, both the price and and that that has shifted over the years um, as well as um, the urgency because of the pool report, um, which the Planning Commission weren't as aware of, as well as AMI and sidewalk projects. So. Well, and I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned OMA, because that's the one I, I keep looking back at. Um, if we want Tiffany to succeed as much as, as best as she can, we need to give her all the tools that she, she needs. My concern is lift her an elevator for only 100 grand. I mean, that seems... And that's an old number. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, and that's and that's just what we used to say that it was that was what it was. I think uh, if I were making a recommendation, that's one that I'd I'd love to see someone do get an engineering estimate and and a real right. plan for how it could happen. I I completely agree that um, 
that facility is most likely to be used by a population that um, is here and willing to only do their entertainment here or near to here and, and part of the reason we <coughs> probably cannot is because we have not made the, the full building accessible. So that would be a good one for, you know, if the opportunity came about to get some money to get a good price on that. Sure. And I, and I agree. I just, I'm, I'm concerned that when we do maybe get in an engineer's report, it may come back with yep. a number we're not prepared for. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it could. And some of these numbers, um, we've, as you know, over the last several years, uh, and, and we talked about this with some of the directors, some of whom are revisiting some of their numbers, um, because we've been kind of showing the same numbers for several years because we weren't spending any money and we weren't doing any projects. So there was really no reason to go out and ask somebody to give me a new number when we had already <coughs> made a decision not to do them. Um, OMA has its own funding stream and does it does have uh, not a lot of uh, extra there, um, but maybe there's an opportunity to do something special. Somehow or another, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's an important asset. Yeah, that's good. It, it appears as though, I mean, for the, for as long as I have been on the city commission, we have been talking about HVA system for city, HVA <laughs> AC system for city hall. <clears throat> I thought we made some movement on that a, about a year ago, but now we pushed it out to 2023. <clears throat> um, and we we had some. We actually had, uh, and Mr. Hapley may you correct me if I get off this, or feel free to come on up. But we we did have some engineering um, review done on that specific project. Um, and in the course of that found that actually some of our systems were doing better than we thought uh, and had some more opportunity and we, we that's one that we kind of thought with other funding may present an opportunity I believe also with <coughs> ARPA funds. What did you say about some of our systems what? I'm not sure that we've seen that that no that study. I, we <laughs> haven't shared that with you because basically they were proposing a lot of work that then when we had our discussion we felt like maybe wasn't ripe to be done yet. That's correct. We after after staff review of it, we asked the engineers to go back and uh, take into take some other things into consideration. They came back to us. Um, it was kind of a uh, I don't know. Um, they're recommending some things that we just don't agree with that we need because they're saying that we're still some things are still operating efficiently. Um, and, and it had, I think Wendy mentioned it, had to do with the uh, air handling system. Parts of the air handling systems may not be meeting certain standards, but they're still providing the efficiency that they need. So um, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know where we're at with The, the with, city manager with took all that under advisement and just told us we weren't going to do it this year. Well, and Michael, you, when you say they are recommending, that's a contractor recommending that? That's, that's an engineer. An engineer? Yeah. And but we had some other feedback that yeah. and, and staff internally felt like some of those choices were spending a lot more dollars than what we were comfortable with recommending. It, it, yeah. To the end, that's probably the bigger thing. There was yeah. significant proposed expenditure that we weren't certain was the best answer right now. Is that? That's a good answer. <laughs> but we'll let the city manager address it with you when the CIP is back on the schedule next Monday. Or and, and this bill, um, I see several uh, mentions that this building is about 50 years old. It's actually just barely 40 years old. Uh, it was built in the early 80s. I happened to be on the board when we built that, built this edifice. Uh, but that doesn't really we'll matter if your uh, HVAC is not up to date. Uh, and another <coughs> though, question I have: uh, There's boys, like 6.8 million dollars worth of projects for 22. Uh, on this list. Um, some of those, are those all kind of addressed in our present budget for 22? Um, and uh, um, then there's <coughs> some things in there that, uh, like Dennis's projects, I think, of, of, I forget the terminology, but will some of them be out of, probably some of them will be out of reserves and some of them will have to be like a lease purchase or something on that fire truck and that kind of stuff? So, I mean, some of these are in the budget and then <coughs> some of them specifically water reclamation are not budgeted yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a 
$1.06 million sanitary sewer project that is becoming we urgent, but it's not been we authorized by you. Usually do, we usually do a bond or, or lease purchase on fire trucks. Like oh, and then on the fire truck specifically, yeah. The, um, the fire truck has been presented to you as a potential lease purchase option for 22. That was part of our yeah. 22 budget discussion. It's also part of our planning for 22 as well. <coughs> um, we'll we will should be bringing some sort of a presentation to you in early January regarding that fire truck. Um, the other items that are in here have either been addressed in the 22 budget or they are planned for some sort of long-term financing reg uh, depending on what the total dollar amount was going to be for the project and some of them we haven't necessarily brought the details to you yet but in putting together our um, financial review and some of our studies um, for rate review for each of our utilities we've put together kind of a preliminary plan Is that a fair mm -hmm. analysis well, and, and I guess I would say just to add to that, that actually starting as early as next Monday, <laughs> you will start seeing some of these projects in front of you. Uh, we have seen a significant <coughs> savings on one of our pro a couple of our projects actually. Uh, if we get them done by the end of the year, or at least get the the parts <coughs> ordered by the end of the year, you know, I'm talking a million dollars that we've got down to like six hundred thousand. You know, with about a four hundred thousand dollars savings over what was projected, uh, sometimes these things just come about so fast, and we never really like to push. You know, but at the same point in time, sometimes it's necessary. You know, so and you know, then to address the the other question, you know, some of these projects we do leave in the same year or the upcoming year. Mm -hmm. You know, just simply because, like you all have talked before, they've been on there for a long, long time, and yes, we do want to get them done. But it just doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. But we we do keep pushing them forward that same way in in the hopes that we figure out, you know, where that money's going to come from and get some of these things done. Just one one last comment on that I might add is that um, some of these might have been budgeted or previously discussed, and they might also be presented to you on a list of potential ARPA projects or for funding. So there's always the potential that instead of what we'd originally planned for them, we might actually be able to finance them another mm -hmm. way, which that's what you know we've been talking about is that there is potential for some of these to change and potentially rather quickly depending on what decisions you make early in this next year. Yeah, and there's like 600,000 for stormwater uh, improvement projects, but that's probably, we probably have the money for that from that collected fees. And there, I don't know what the balance of that is. I don't have that in front of me, but I want to say that those were both planned projects, and I believe we addressed them both in the budget, but I cannot remember whether the $500,000 project was planned to be financed or paid by cash. I believe that's the Cedar Street project that we're planning to pay for cash this year, or in 2022. It'll be putting uh, curb inlets, new <coughs> curbs, and pipe from 13th to 15th. The other one was oak and poplar, and it's it, it, uh, it's just a study, I think, for next year's. Oak and poplar is is designed, but we wanted to keep it to where we could pay cash for it, so that's why we're only doing this. <coughs> It's a really good you exercise. Said that's, that's just a study? Well, I don't know. You just had 75 in for Oak and Poplar this year and then a 750 potential for 23. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that was some upgraded design, but I, I can pull That it. might be to, to upgrade the, the construction costs and everything. I, that was probably a guess. Mm -hmm. But bottom line, Oak and Poplar is already designed. It's, it's going to okay. be a it, – it's one that I have sitting on the shelf ready to go. Two million dollars for a sanitary sewer across the river. That's done. Yes. We talked. And, and talked yes, about we've, that talked, we've talked year. about this a number of times. Uh, quite honestly, uh, as we begin to see more growth on the north side of, of the river, uh, we are finding ourselves in a position where we're not going to be able to handle it. Quite honestly, and uh, this project has been on the books. Uh, I'm going to say probably closer to 15 years mm -hmm. and has not been accomplished yet. And so, uh, yeah, 
it's uh, 2.6 million dollars but if we find that we're stagnating growth that may happen out there because we can't serve those entities that would probably be a fairly inexpensive 2.6 million dollars we literally had a meeting i had a meeting with developers last week about two or three different parcels that would be greatly impacted if this were not done um, our entire k68 corridor and the, the both south and north of k68 east of davis are mm -hmm. highly well, dependent you have to go under <coughs> it'll be under yeah. the river yeah. yes mm -hmm. and and in fact you know this project has gone as far as to procure all of the easements you know all the necessary ground to to get this project done uh, some of the design has been done on this project it hasn't been addressed for a while so kind of like we were just talking a moment ago we'll have to go back and readdress that but uh, the thing holding it up <laughs> that is old money line, it's got to be how old I mean 50 years old how old uh, the the current line yeah yeah it's right in there someplace yeah right in that 50 year mark yeah mm -hmm. yeah you know, plus the list of the lift stations that we're talking about that would be replaced by that cottonwood lift are the same thing, you know, that we've managed to keep running for 15 years. Kind of like the project we're going to talk to you about come Monday. Yeah. You know, uh, the Rockwood lift is, is what we're going to talk to you about though, that we've found, uh, and it is more than 50 years old. It is closer to 60 years old. No, I just, you know, it's got to be done. All right, commissioners. So that's our initial look at our CIP for um, for this year. Is it um, the intention, or is it the will of the commission to hold this over and have any additional questions that we may have next week? All right, we shall do so. That moves us on to um, the comments by our city manager, which I believe will be given by our city attorney. <coughs> Madam Mayor, Commissioners, I uh, have two things for you. First is an uh, update from Michael Hafley with the Public Works Department on the new Parks Building. Some of you had asked about that and the status, so uh, we'll have Michael come up. He brought you some pretty pictures. I've only got about 300, so it shouldn't take too long. So this picture shows the new building. We've got the sign up. We've had the sign up for a while. That was one of the first things that got done. Um, <clears throat> oh no! Nice sign. Yeah, we do try. Next slide. This is the best picture I could show you um, of what we started with. We didn't get a picture. We didn't think to start taking pictures until after we had the the old offices tore down. But that shows the, the front door and where the, where the office and break areas are gonna go. Next slide. This is the framing of it. Um, it actually is going, you'll see as, as we progress through here, it's gonna be a really nice space for the guys. So next slide. Just another picture of the framing. What we'll end up with on top is a, is a me mezzanine for storage. So um, next slide. Just another picture of that uh, of the framing. Next slide. Now you're starting to see it closed <coughs> in with the railings on the on the top for the mezzanine for you know obvious safety reasons. Um, the light, the fluorescent lights you see behind the railing are coming out. We're putting uh, LED lights up there to for more efficiency and better lighting. Next slide. This is the inside, the the hallway from the front door coming in. Um, as they had it taped and mudded. I don't believe they had primer on it yet, but anyway, next slide. This is a view from the top of the mezzanine. You can see how much more space we'll have in that building uh, compared to what we currently have in the, in the two old buildings. Um, the utilities department has already brought some stuff in and, and claimed their space in the building. Um, so, but we'll still end up with, with, enough, with more than enough space for for everything we told you we'd use it for. So next slide. This is just the wiring that's going on for those new lights upstairs on the mezzanine. This is the break room and, and this picture is really, really deceiving because it looks really small, but it is not that small, I promise you. The guys are gonna have a better break room than what they ever had over there. I, I, I'm not a very good photographer and this is the best picture I could 
I could get to show you what what the room is going to look like. You can obviously see with the two ceiling fans that it is bigger than what it what it appears to be. Next slide. This is the office area. Greg and DJ will actually share this office space instead of walling it off and having having two offices in there. We thought it'd be better to have have a single office. Um, so next slide. Or is that it? That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we went through the 300 pictures that I told you about. So where we're at right now um, with the project, our, our goal is still to be in by the end of the year. I don't, I'm not 100% sure we're going to be able to make it, but we'll be, be in there shortly after. Um, once the break room, the office area is done, we still have the fence to put up around the, the uh, lot out back to the, on the east side. Um, we're still waiting on fencing and costs for the fence and all that stuff. That's kind of been a nightmare for us to get. Um, but right now, w w as far as the budget, I told you the remodel along with fencing would cost around $70,000. Right now, I, ha I, I don't see any issue in, in exceeding that or with having, having to exceed that. So <clears throat> we're actually sitting in, in, in pretty good shape. And the guys, you know, and, and one thing about it, we've, we've done all this work ourselves <coughs> with, with city employees with the exception of the of the sheetrock and the taping and the mudding. We, for the price we got on that, we, we decided, and, and the time frame that the guy gave us, he told us he could do it in eight days, and we figured we'd have eight days just taping and mudding. So, um, and the guy actually got it done in four. So it, it, it's actually moving along pretty good, pretty quick. Um, like I said, we're, we're hoping to be in there before the end of the year, but I'm not, not sure we're quite going to make it. Yeah. So, Mike, we've been talking about the capital improvement plan. It's kind of nice to see some of these projects come to fruition, like we've been talking about this same thing for I don't know how many years. But well, it good. started in Windy 7, 2007, I believe, 2004, 2007, oh, um, with my predecessor, <laughs> and, and it's taken me seven years to get us here. So, Good. Good work. So, thank you. Thank you for the update, Mr. Hayfley. I don't want to steal the thunder. I don't want to steal the thunder, but if you haven't driven by Second Street and seen that there's a new water car standing as long as we're talking about yeah. CIP projects getting yeah. done. It's not in service yet, but there is a new water tower standing at the power plant. Good. The cooling tower. And the cooling, cooling tower. tower. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Mayor, Commissioners, the other item I had uh, under this report for your comments uh, concerns the uh, Mayor's Christmas Tree Fund. Um, Cosentino's Price Chopper, the Cosentino family, has again this year uh, made a donation, this year $2,000, towards the Mayor's Christmas Tree Fund. You typically discuss uh, how you want to spend that money at this time each year, and typically that's done in a form of a charitable donation to help those who are in need this Christmas season. Uh, and so uh, with that, I uh, want to give that issue to all of you. You can discuss tonight if you want, or you can discuss next Monday if you're going to be meeting, but wanted to uh, make you aware of it so you could instruct us on where to direct those funds. We'd like to do that in this calendar year uh, for those accounting <coughs> purposes that uh, Melanie talked about earlier. Um, so if you can uh, make a decision tonight or on Monday. Um, with that, Ms. Madam Mayor, I'll hand it back to you since it's your Christmas tree fund. <laughs> Um, thank you. So I reached out to ECAN to ask them historically what they had been putting these monies aside to. And, and I know that we all <coughs> have, um, have faith that um, the monies that have been allocated to the organizations um, through this particular um, generous donation from the Constantino family um, have been used well. I just wanted some clarification on how that had been used. And so um, it appears as that um, in the past and anything moving forward, including if we were to choose to make a donation to ECAN, that um, they will be um, allocating these funds to do direct service um, to citizens here, of, citizens of Ottawa, including um, food pantry and um, any other direct services that they may need. So um, I'm, I was glad to hear that um, they have been cognizant about making sure that that is money that is directly given out to citizens who really um, are in a vulnerable state in their lives. So um, I would like to see us, um, you know, commit the funds this particular year and really just be the pass through um, to to ECAN this year. To to what? To ECAN. <coughs> Has anyone talked to the Constantinos? Or are they happy with how we have dispersed our funds? They actually are. And, and I have, um, I speak with um, 
with Don, the manager, but I also speak with, uh, with um, Mr. John Constantino whenever he's in town, it appears. And um, they're, they're happy with how we utilize those okay. funds. Okay. I'm fine with that, too, if, that's, if we need action on that tonight or you want to, I mean, if it is Christmas, I guess we better get it before Christmas. Yeah. Well, it, I don't believe that it'll probably um, be disseminated to citizens before Christmas. That it's a great way to start 2022 on a on a fresh start um, with a, uh, a generous donation to ECAN. So, I'll make a motion that we uh, that we take the two thousand dollars that was donated to the Mayor's Christmas Tree Fund and donate that to ECAN. And I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on commissioners? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Madam Mayor, I apologize. I had one other thing for you that I was supposed to get to, and that is um, some of you have heard uh, of, of citizen concerns with Vive um, and their service here in the community. Uh, the city manager had asked Paul Summer to uh, stay with you to the end of the meeting tonight to give you a quick update on some conversations they've been having with Vive. So can get spare just a moment for that, Paul? I'll make this really quick. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, we have talked to the CEO of Vive. Uh, we've talked to the local area representative for the state of Kansas, and they are going to have somebody that's going to come in here early next year to a study session uh, and talk to all of you and address any concerns and answer any questions that you might have. They're aware of the environment here in Ottawa, uh, and so I think they understand what I was telling them, and they're anxious to come in here and answer any questions and, and tell you the things that they have been doing uh, to improve their system, which they have not, in my opinion, been doing a good job of putting out to the public. So we're excited to arrange that meeting and hopefully you know, get them here very soon. Do you anticipate that in January or February? Is this just I would say scheduling January, at this point? Yeah. Okay. Any questions for Paul regarding his conversation with Vive? We we get a lot of comments. A lot of uh, what uh, the service is deficient. Yeah, mostly. There's just a lot of negative comments uh, in the community about either the service or the reliability. Uh, those kind of aspects. Uh, so we'd like to have them come in here and address some of that. Any other questions for Paul? Okay. Thank you, Paul. All right, thanks. Uh, City Attorney? I have nothing further. Okay. That moves us on to reports by our City Commissioners. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Crowley? I have no report. Commissioner Wigan? I have no report. Uh, Commissioner Skidmore. And just a Merry Christmas to all. And Commissioner Graves. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no report or Merry Christmas to all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Just making sure. Um, that moves on to reports by the mayor. Um, before we do that and before I give my report, uh, we do need to circle back and have a conversation about Planning Commission. Um, as a reminder, <coughs> We have three applicants, Katie Butts, Brian Kane, and Rudy Baines, who have all applied and all been interviewed by the City Commission. Um, there is city residency required for both of those um, open spots, and all of those individuals, all those applicants meet that. Um, is there a discussion to how the Commission would like to move forward on appointing two individuals to the Planning Commission? Mm -hmm. um, I think. Madam Mayor. Um, yes. <clears throat> for transparency purposes, because of my relationship with Rudy Maines, I'd prefer to stay out of this vote. Mm -hmm. um, if the commission comes to an impasse, I believe that I can be fair and impartial and um, uh, make the deciding vote, but I'd prefer not to. Okay. Thank you for your for I your just wanted disclosure. to comment that we had really three, I think, well-qualified candidates. It's a tough decision, uh, but I am prepared to make a recommendation. Other Thoughts from other commissioners? I think we can't lose here. Um, and what a great problem to have. Um, I think every single individual who has applied um, has the city's interest in the be or city's best interest at heart. Um, and I hope that whomever is not placed on it actually finds another opportunity 
um, to serve because we always need individuals who um, really believe in our city to sit on um, not just the planning commission but all of the boards in which that um, are within the city limits yeah I wish we could appoint three I guess in this case mm -hmm. but we only two right so that makes it difficult you're right they're very very qualified people and I appreciate their willingness to serve our community would you need a motion um, if, if you have one I have one okay I uh, move we appoint uh, Rudy Maines and Katie Butts to the Planning Commission is there a second Is there a second? Mm. Dies for the lack of a second. <laughs> is there um, another motion that would like to be made? <clears throat> well, I, I, this is hard to do because uh, I respect all these people very much. I was kind of thinking about uh, Kane and Maines myself as the motion. Um, I feel like both of them in the field of, of their work uh, that gives them an extra edge over maybe serving in that capacity as a plumber and as a builder and I say I think sometimes those kind of people can maybe uh, just add a di different dimension uh, extra dimension of, of uh, experience to the com planning commission so I'd make the motion we appoint uh, Brian Kane and, and uh, Rudy Maines it's been moved that we appoint Brian um, Kane and Rudy Maines to the planning commission is there a second I'll second it's been moved and seconded is there any discussion among commissioners If not, we will proceed to vote. How do you vote, Commissioner Skidmore? Yes. Commissioner Whitehead? Yes. Commissioner Drage? Yes. Mm. Hall abstain. Mayor Taylor? And I vote yes. Motion carries. Um, we'd like to thank Brian Kane and Rudy Means for um, being willing to sit on the Planning Commission and um, certainly hope that Katie would choose to um, continue to serve our community another way and know that. Uh, in just a year from now we will have another opening on our planning commission and so uh, we hope that uh, that is of consideration at that time um, that does move us on to reports by the mayor um, a couple things I just wanted to bring to your attention today um, in collaboration well actually it's been really for the last month um, we've been working with uh, two different building owners um, in downtown in our historic district um, to complete what's called the HEAL grant, the Historic Economic Asset Lifeline grant. Um, those grants were submitted today with a letter of recommendation from the city, from Ottawa Main Street, and from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we certainly hope that those uh, go forward. Uh, the whole purpose on the HEAL grant is to revitalize an underutilized or a dilapidated building. Um, we luckily do not have a tremendous amount of those um, buildings in our Main Street corridor, but we do have a couple. And so we have found um, a couple of those and those owners um, who are willing to uh, look at revitalizing those uh, buildings um, in an application for the HEAL grant. So uh, let's all cross our fingers and hope that uh, Department of Commerce sees that um, that is really a money well spent and uh, we will keep you posted. Uh, I don't believe we have anything else to come before us today. Um, we do have a study session at 4 o'clock on the 27th. And then I did ask you commissioners to consider whether or not you wanted to have a study session on the 3rd. Um, what, is, what are the thoughts of the City Commission regarding um, the 3rd? Okay with me. I think it'd be okay to take it off. I guess we have a meeting on the 5th, but uh, we've got enough on the agenda already. I don't know. I'm fine with skipping. Okay. So we will cancel our uh, January 3rd study session, and then we will have our regular meeting on the 5th at 7 p.m. Is there anything else that need to be brought needs to be brought before the City Commission today? If not, we will adjourn the meeting at 5.52.